Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I am so excited. We're about to reach episode 200. Can you believe it? Our podcast is turning 200. We're going to be releasing episode 200 on Friday. I would love it if you could jump into our Facebook group, the Learn True Health Facebook group. You can search Learn True Health in Facebook, or you can go to learntruehealth.com slash group, and that'll redirect you to the Facebook group. And in it, you'll see a post where I'm asking you to share your experience as a listener. Please tell me your story. I'd love to hear it. What impact has this podcast had in your life? What positive things have you learned and, and implemented and seen a positive shift in your health and your life as a result of this podcast? I'm going to be selecting some of your stories and sharing them in episode 200 to celebrate. So please jump into the Facebook group, Learn True Health, and share your story. I'd love to hear it and I'd love to hear you participate in our group. Also, recently we started posting before a guest comes onto the show, I post and ask you to share your questions should you have any for that guest. We have lots of great doctors and health experts on specific topics like autoimmune conditions and migraines, better sleep, more energy, balanced hormones, uh, different dietary theories. And you can jump right in and ask your questions and I will pose those questions on air and you can feel like you're participating along with me, learning from all these wonderful experts. So please jump in the Facebook group. We can have a lot of fun there together. Look forward to seeing you there and enjoy today's episode. It's a wonderful one. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 198. This is going to be such an awesome interview. I am so thrilled. I'm really passionate about this subject. Jennifer Fugo is an expert when it comes to going gluten-free. She even has her own school and her own awesome podcast. Glutenfreeschool.com is her website. She's a functional nutritionist and, uh, and she has so much information to share with us about why we should go gluten-free, how to go gluten-free, the ins and outs, the uh, landmines, <laughs> as it were, to uh, avoid when going gluten-free. Uh, and she also has a fantastic book, uh, The Savvy Gluten-Free Shopper, How to Eat Healthy Without Breaking the Bank. Oh, that is actually one of the main complaints when people try to go gluten-free. It's so expensive. And so I'm glad you're here to uh, bust that myth wide open and help people to see. Actually, my husband and I saved about two or $300 a month on our grocery bill when we went gluten-free. So we, we must have uh, done it right. But Jennifer, I'm really excited for you to be here and to teach our wonderful listeners all the things that they need to know when they go gluten-free. So welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Ashley. And I'm excited to, you know, whatever questions you have, feel free, throw them my way. I hope I can teach everybody and impart my knowledge as best as I can in the um, short amount of time that we have together. It's not short. We're going to talk for a while. We, so we it are. Be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I've been, my husband and I have been gluten-free for seven years. And even that way, I mean, you know, some people were gluten-free back then, but I felt kind of like um, an alien. Um, people looked at me, I'd go to a restaurant, do you have a gluten-free menu? And I mean, people would look at me like, what? Um, now, seven years later, it's, it's, um, in most areas widely known, especially in the Pacific Northwest, they've really gone gluten-free, uh, much uh, sooner than a lot of other uh, regions around the world. Especially I go to California and I kind of expect them to be on the ball with it. And, uh, and I find that uh, Seattle is more progressive in terms of the gluten-free movement than, than LA, which, uh, which impressed me. Um, where, where do you live? Do you live in an area that is uh, widely accepting the gluten-free movement? I do actually, I live outside of Philadelphia and we happen to have, it was, it's called Beyond Celiac. It's one of the big organizations in the U S that does like certifying um, products and a lot of educational stuff around celiac disease and they're located here in Philadelphia. So they have pushed 
a big um, kitchen certification uh, program for restaurants. And so a lot of restaurants here either offer gluten-free options. We have some like totally gluten-free restaurants as well. And fortunately, a lot of these larger, I would say more upscale chains of restaurants have started to offer gluten-free menus. And so because I live in an area that has a lot of them, available to me, I, you know, I have no problem going out to eat at all. So I really enjoy it. I mean, New York is easy. Um, you know, even like I go down to this small town by the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland and they have a gluten-free bakery. They have a really great place that does gluten-free food along with, um, just like regular food that's not, you know, contaminated, but they do an excellent job. So even in smaller towns, you're starting to see these places pop up that are offering people options. So it's really, really different from how it was seven to 10 years ago. I started t this journey 10 years ago and boy, have how things have changed. That's so cool. I am. Um... In uh, Alberta, Canada, the province in Canada, I have a lot of friends there. And in small places like uh, Camrose, population 18,000 people, they have people who do gluten-free baking and uh, and there's there's gluten-free options. You know, it's 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 fun to see that in these smaller regions when when a few families uh, go gluten-free kind of then sparks that um that ripple effect, especially celiac might have been the original uh, diagnosis, but a, a lot of families will go gluten free for that one individual in their family that is celiac. And then they start noticing health benefits and they start telling their friends and it, and it can be like this uh, wildfire, this grassroots movement. Um, now there's a lot of people that don't live in regions where there's gluten free restaurants and, and easily accessible gluten-free products. And that's, I'm sure why listening to your podcast or going to your website, glutenfreeschool.com, uh, would help them. I want to definitely get into all of this, why someone should go gluten-free, you know, uh, are there people that shouldn't go gluten-free answer all those questions we have. But first I'd love to know your story. Can you share your story, uh, with the listeners and what led you to become this enthusiast and this educator around the gluten-free movement? Well, my journey is very similar to most people who have gotten sick. And so back in like, I would say 2006, 2007, I got really into working out and I was riding road bikes and doing a lot of exercise. And I started to notice that despite how much I exercised and despite how like restrictive I was with my diet, I was actually gaining weight, feeling more fatigued, um, getting sick every six to eight weeks. And that, that was the main thing that concerned me. I had a, a litany of other symptoms, but I didn't at the time know that they were connected to any of this. And so I went to the doctor and I said, look, I am so tired at night. I'm sleeping like 11 hours. And even after 11 hours of sleep, I can't wake up. I don't know what to do. My husband's like shaking me to get me out of bed. And he agreed that that was not normal and decided to do a bunch of labs. The labs came back normal though. And he really didn't know what to tell me beyond like, maybe you just need some B vitamins and don't exercise so much. And I, you know, I was fine with cutting back on the exercise, but it didn't really make any difference. I was still getting sick all the time and I just generally did not feel well. And so I had spoken to my cousin. It's funny you mentioned LA. She lives out in LA and she said, look, I'm really connected in the like holistic health world. I think you should come out and see a nutritionist because I think they're going to have a much different view of what's going on with you than like your conventional doctor. And upon seeing a friend of hers who was a nutritionist, the first, I think after she read my form about like what I eat on a daily basis and I'm Italian. So I ate my <laughs> fair share of bread, pasta, pizza. The guy was a total breadaholic. Um, she's like, do you know what gluten is? And that question completely changed my life because I had never heard of gluten before. I had no clue what it was. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And so she suggested after our conversation that I go gluten-free for two weeks and see how I felt. And so after I would say three days, and 
you know, it's important that I specify before I go into this, that my experience is my experience alone and not everyone will have the same experience. Okay. So it's important to manage people's expectations of what's going to happen. But my experience was that after three days, I noticed that my stomach was a lot quieter, that I wasn't running to the bathroom with chronic really bad explosive diarrhea. And I don't mind talking about poop. So if anybody listening to this is like, Oh my (laughs) God, I didn't think I was going to hear about poop. Like, you know, unfortunately I said there were a lot of symptoms that I had that I did not connect to what I was eating. And so the explosive diarrhea stopped the horrible, disgusting smelling gas that I had constantly had stopped. Um, I, I felt like more clear headed as if a light had been turned on in my brain. I did not again, know that brain fog was associated with gluten sensitivity. And so I called the nutritionist and I said, listen, I feel so dramatically better after three days. However, I've had a couple of bouts of diarrhea that I can't explain because everything that I'm eating is gluten free. She said, all right, let's do some food sensitivity testing. And that revealed that I was highly sensitive to both egg whites and egg yolks. So the entire chicken egg, um, the casein protein, which is found in all dairy. And then obviously gluten was on there. Uh, the entire cruciferous family. So all those dark leafy greens, like kale, everyone loves except for me. And, um, the cashew family that includes cashews, pistachios, and mangoes. And so I was a little taken back. I I had never heard of food sensitivities. I didn't really understand the difference between them and food allergies. I just knew that I wasn't going into anaphylaxis and I wasn't developing hives. I just felt really sick and I couldn't figure out why. And the, the idea or notion that food could be behind my problems seemed incredibly, like in one sense, it's, it felt crazy because Aside from me being Italian, the other important thing your readers might want to know is that my dad is a doctor. He's an MD um, and he's a surgeon. So I have been steeped for my entire life in Western conventional medicine. And my dad was very skeptical of this because he's like, I've never heard of such a thing. Um, This sounds a little (laughs) crazy, but I guess like give it a try. What's the worst that can happen? Well, lo and behold, about fast forward about four months. So I've kept out eggs, dairy, gluten, the cruciferous family, the cashew family. I've kept all these things out successfully. And I had lost close to 20 pounds and it's not fat to be clear. It was inflammation. Your tissue can become inflamed when it is constantly triggered by an immune response and become inflamed. And that can appear to be weight that you can't seem to exercise off, but in reality, it's not actually fat. So I don't, I don't believe in any sense that I lost 20 pounds of weight. I like to clarify that because I, I, it makes me uncomfortable that some people think that they can go gluten-free and just lose weight. And that's not, that's not the case. It was water, know, water weight, infl- yeah, inflammation weight. It was inflammation weight. Um, I also stopped getting headaches every day. I have mm. had, I had had headaches since I was a young teenager and took Tylenol almost every day. I feel wow. bad for my poor liver, but now at least I know what was causing that. I had rashes on my arms and my legs that were like spirally in pattern, scaly, itchy, dry. Again, those cleared up. So I was having all this, this really interesting physical changes that seemed like all over the place because again, I was not truly familiar with what gluten sensitivity entailed and how the symptoms are so, they seem very disconnected, you know, like you wouldn't connect brain fog with like a rash on your arm. And yet when it comes to a lot of these, um, sense food sensitivities or even autoimmune disease, a lot of times the symptoms are all over the place, which is why it makes it, 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 sorry, why it becomes so difficult for doctors to really pinpoint the, the correct diagnosis because they're looking at your arm. And specifically the skin on your arm. And then they want to send you to a neurologist for your headaches. And it's almost like dissecting the body into these small, tiny parts that, you know, they don't really integrate very well. They're not looking at the whole picture of what's happening to your body. Um, And so in 
having all these amazing changes take place of getting rid of the digestive issues, of stopping this low immunity that was causing me to get sick every six to eight weeks, the headaches gone, um, losing this inflammation weight, um, the rashes disappearing, et cetera, all these changes, people who hadn't seen me in six months were so confused. They were like, what did you do? Cause I looked completely different. And that's actually what helped my dad go from a disbeliever to a believer. And so in the process of doing this, I really had zero help. Um, there were very few books out there. There were three websites that I had found some with very questionable information. And I felt that to be honest, there had to be a better way. And that was literally how over the years gluten-free school started because I became very adept at helping other people go gluten-free in a, a much less stressful fashion, but also much more efficiently. Um, so people who have struggled, I have clients who were trying to be gluten-free for five years, six years, 10 years, and still doing it wrong. I'm able to get them to a, a place where they can actually go from zero to 100% gluten-free compliant, enjoying their diet, liking what they're doing, being able to stand up for themselves in somewhere between six to eight weeks. So, you know, that's, that was the whole point was to help simplify the process for people, um, empower them to make these changes and to allow them to see that, yes, you can still live a really fun, enjoyable life. You just have to be a little savvy about it and a little smarter about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's what everything I've done with like the book and, um, you know, all the information I share at gluten-free school and then working with clients and becoming a clinical nutritionist, because I really wanted to help women who were just not getting better where gluten-free wasn't enough, um, find that freedom to get back to being with their kids or their grandkids and being more present in their own daily lives and having the energy that they don't have now and sleeping better, all that stuff. Um, I love what I do. And, um, yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's the long of short of it. Very cool. So when did you first go gluten-free? How many years ago? It was back in early 2008. So almost 10 years now. Got it. Very cool. And when did you start the glutenfreeschool.com? I began that website in 2011. So I had been gluten-free for quite some time before that, that journey began. Right, right. You know, it's your story is exactly, if you were to take my husband's symptoms and his story and my, my uh, symptoms and my story and put mush them together, it was like, I was like listening to our story because, uh, <laughs> we went like seven years ago, we went gluten free and, um, I lost 25 pounds in the first month. My husband lost something similar and it was water weight. Absolutely. Um, we actually, um, have a saying, my husband, and I have a saying called gluten face and yeah. we can, when we go to Costco, we look at people before looking in their cart, we look at their face and we can guess what's in their cart by their face, you know? Uh, circles under their eyes, puffy, they're sort of, their face is round. You could tell even if they're skinny people, they have inflammation. You can really see it. Um, we ha we got our pictures taken for a driver's license right before we went gluten-free and we look like different people. We look mm -hmm. like, like, like someone just, um, stretched out our face, uh, kind of like Ernie and Bert, you know, uh, the, from Sesame street, like, like they took yep. our face and they just stretched it out. And made us round. We, we just like look like the Michelin man. We look round and puffy and bloated. And we went gluten free and that all went away. In fact, our wedding rings, um, we had to go down. Um, my husband went down two sizes and I went down one and a half sizes because my wedding rings, our wedding rings would fly off our hands. And, and this, this one of my rings is um, an heirloom passed down uh, from, you know, a few generations in my family. And, uh, and I was really afraid of, of having it adjusted, uh, get, you know, smaller if, uh, I would just, you know, go back to being the same puffiness. Right. And so we waited quite a while, but the puffiness never came back. My husband, his whole life could never digest chicken or turkey. He had a really bad reaction. He's very allergic to turkey and he, um, had a similar reaction to basically, you wouldn't even want me to tell you what would happen to his body if he ate it. Uh, but like you said, that the foul smell, he'd clear a room and have to run to the toilet, that kind of thing. 
Um, yep. After going gluten-free, he can eat chicken and have zero symptoms. There are foods that he could never eat before, never digest, that after going gluten-free, his body could digest and assimilate and have no problem doing it. And I thought that was amazing. I had chronic adrenal fatigue and and uh, a lot of the symptoms you shared, going gluten-free, it, it all went away. I mean, it was like a miracle. It was, it felt like a miracle. And I bumped into people that said, oh, I tried that and it didn't work. And I just, I just, I'm like, I kind of question whether they actually did. I think a lot of people don't understand that you can't do it halfway or part of the way. You have to go all the way gluten-free. I will say though, I don't come from the mindset that I think that everyone is sensitive to gluten. Um, I know that there are plenty of experts and colleagues of mine that will say, no, 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 no one should eat gluten. It's really bad for you, blah, blah, blah. But you know, the reality of it is we are all different and mm -hmm. why some people can digest things better than others. You know, there, there are a myriad of reasons that come from your historical health. Uh, from your parents and not even just genetics, but like how you were born, were you a vaginal birth or a C-section, um, chemical and toxic, uh, other environmental toxic exposures that you have been exposed to stress, stressors. I mean, I was in Manhattan when 9-11 happened. So I lived there and I lived through it and it was an incredibly stressful time and a very big stressor on my early twenties. Um, so, I mean, we have to look at a variety of factors. You know, you could have gut infections if you've had any sort of, like if you've gone to Mexico and you've gotten food poisoning or even just at a restaurant locally and you've gotten food poisoning, that can dramatically shift the gut flora and the diversity of the gut flora that you have, making you more susceptible to having problems down the road. Um, you know, they even can say like, uh, I, I read, I was listening to one case study uh, by a really fascinating functional medicine doctor where she was showing that a candida overgrowth had actually triggered um, celiac disease in this woman. Now, granted, she was uh, genetically susceptible to it, but celiac was her trigger, or um, excuse me, candida was her trigger. So everyone is different. And I think that if you're not feeling well, you have to ask yourself this one question. And the one question is, what is most important to you? What is your priority? Is your priority being present for every other person in the world except for yourself, which is very common for women in general, but especially moms. It's very hard for moms to tune in and take care of themselves because they feel like they're being selfish. Um, or are you, you know, again, more concerned with making sure the house is in order and your husband's happy and all this other stuff? Because the thing is, if you don't allow room for you to tune in and go on this journey of figuring out what the imbalances are, they don't just mysteriously or miraculously disappear. Things build slowly with time. You don't one day wake up and go, oh my gosh, the bread's making me sick. That's usually not the case. It's something that you've had for a very long time that has slowly brewed underneath the surface until the point where your body, which has such incredible intelligence, can't bear to keep things in check anymore. And that's where we start to see this real breakdown in health. Nobody ended up with... Uh, cardiovascular disease in one day. It's something that accumulates with time. That's how chronic disease develops. It's typically due to a variety of factors that over time coalesce, overwhelming the body's ability to maintain normalcy and homeostasis, a really good balance of how things should be. And that's why you know, the longer people wait, you know, if you have chronic diarrhea, for example, let me tell you what happens if you have chronic diarrhea in case anybody's wondering. And I think this is an important conversation to have because I am actually shocked at the number of people that have this, like this one issue. We could also talk about chronic constipation as well, but these are things doctors don't tell you. So if you have chronic diarrhea, which was my case, and it sounds like, was it your husband's issue as well? Ashley? He actually, he had chronic constipation, but if he okay. ate a, if he ate a food like a turkey or chicken, he'd, he'd end up with diarrhea, acute diarrhea during that time. Um, we actually, uh, he still had constipation after going gluten-free. We healed it. 
with a vegetable with a bone bone broth vegetable soup where the cabbage was the base. He ate it every day for seven days. And, and it healed his gut completely. He had chronic constipation his entire life, you know, up to his 40s. And then that one thing, we, we learned this from an naturopath, that there's some healing properties, gut healing properties in uh, cabbage. And uh, and so so I couldn't believe that something as simple as eating a, a, a broth that was, I used an immersion blender and blended okay. all the cabbage and the beet uh, celery roots, some really good stuff in there, uh, with the bone broth and, but mainly cabbage. Right. And he just had it one meal a day for seven days. And after that, and that was four or five years ago, he has not had one bout of constipation. So he's been totally normal. Uh, isn't That's that amazing? Awesome. That is so amazing. It really is. And it's a good thing too, because every time I like to equate this to like you know, the food is coming down the pipeline. You eat food, you know, you, you have the food coming down the pipeline, but you also have bacteria good and bad. There's always, a, it's always about a balance in the colon. And when your small intestine becomes really irritated for whatever reason, it could be because of gluten or there's things in there that are irritating it because maybe you're sensitive to them or the proteins or sugars or whatever aren't able to be digested enough or the mucosal membrane that lines the small intestine um, is deteriorated. And so there's more irritation going on and inflammation. Um, when your body kicks food out, you number one, lose the opportunity to become nourished by that food. So that's literally like flushing a toilet and saying, oh, we don't need to eat that. We don't need to absorb that. Just because you eat it and it went in doesn't mean that the vitamins and minerals and the proteins and the fats, all of the stuff that you need to thrive actually got absorbed. So that's the number one problem is that you are losing nutrition out, out, out to sea essentially. Now, the other thing that happens is when that essential toilet flush happens within the digestive system, you're also flushing out the bacterial diversity, the microbiome that's in the colon. So I'm not going to sit here and say that like all the bacteria go. But the problem is that it becomes very difficult for good bacteria to reestablish itself in a timely fashion. And so you are losing and, and causing a disruption within the microbiome of the colon. And so that's really hard because people are then stuck in this situation where oftentimes they'll end up with candida or yeast overgrowth. They'll have um, more bad bacteria that will flourish as opposed to the good bacteria. Um, and they become afraid of food because they don't know what exactly is making them sick. And so they eat a diet that's more processed and that ultimately feeds the bad bacteria, the yeast, et cetera. And, and it will not ultimately allow for healthy bacteria to be able to colonize and stay put and do its job, which is to, to help you break down food, but also to keep the bad bacteria and the yeast in check. Um, the flip side is with constipation, you're slowing down your body's ability to be able to release toxins and waste. And so, for example, for women, this is really important. If you've been chronically uh, constipated, your estrogen, which is processed through your liver in order to be deactivated. So we don't just keep recycling estrogen. We want to get it out. Otherwise, you can end up in a state of estrogen dominance, and that can play into thyroid problems and all sorts of things. And so when estrogen is deactivated in the, in the liver, it's released into your bile and then the bile is dumped into the digestive system. So you literally poop out deactivated estrogen. That's how it's supposed to leave your body. But if the, if your poop is not moving at a normal rate and a normal rate, by the way, is going to the bathroom without straining one to three times a day, by the way. I just want to clarify that because I have plenty of people that think that it's normal to not poop for seven days and that is abnormal. It's not normal to poop for three days. One to three times a day without straining. That's normal. And so when the estrogen takes an excessively long amount of time sitting in your lower intestine or in, this, in the large intestine, excuse me, um, your body can actually end up turning it back on and reabsorbing it. And that's one way that women can end up in a state of estrogen dominance. Um, there can also be bacteria. They're not friendly to 
us and they if if they end up in the in the small in, or in the large intestine they can also they have an enzyme that will return the that will turn the estrogen back on and when it's turned back on it's reabsorbed so that's another problem um, the other issue too is that you're not able to release the toxins that are released by the bacteria and the yeast etc in the large intestine you're not able to get it out and so for anyone who's like, oh, well, from listening to this, I think I have leaky gut and I'm going to do a leaky gut protocol. If anything you do with your gut, if you are constipated, the first issue that you have to address is getting yourself to pooping much more normally, at least once a day. Because if you don't and you start throwing in like a liver detoxification or something else, you're not able to actually release the toxins and get things moving. It can make you feel worse. So there's those two sides of things that we really want to consider of why it's important to poop one to three times a day without straining, without taking 45 minutes to go to the bathroom. Um, and then also to be not being on the other side of things where you eat something and you have to run to the bathroom. Cause I have been in that boat and it is horrible and it's embarrassing. And I have clients that come to me and they can't even go to work because, um, like I had one woman who told me she used to go like 10 times in the morning before she could even get out the door to go to work. Wow. And so, you know, and she's, she's gone to doctors and they've just been like, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe take some Lamotol. Oh, so what, um, so what should someone with diarrhea or constipation do to uh, bring their body back into balance? Uh, what are some quick ways that'll help them? Is going gluten-free uh, one of those ways, one of those things they should definitely try? I absolutely would. I would say give it like two to three weeks, give it a shot, see how you feel, see if it makes a difference, but it's got to be 100%. That would be my only thing. I'd also do like a food journal, write down all the things that you eat. That way, if you start heading for the bathroom, you can go, okay, did I just eat something that may have triggered this reaction? If I had done that, I would have picked up on the fact that it was the eggs that were a problem for me. Mm. So a food journal can be incredibly um, helpful. I ask my clients to do it. And guess what? It's a free thing to do, <laughs> by the way. The free stuff. Nobody wants to do the free stuff. They all want like can I spend a thousand dollars on labs? I'm like, can you just journal your food? Like this is one, this is a really simple, but incredibly effective tool. Um, now, as far as like headaches, if the headache is immediate, that's one thing, but sometimes with food sensitivities, you can have delayed reactions. That's where you get the rashes, the brain fog, etc. And by the way, it's not abnormal. Like if you eat Say you go to a restaurant and you eat a ton of bread, like you can't stop yourself from eating the bread basket and then you have pasta and you feel drunk, literally drunk, like your vision gets blurry, you feel intoxicated, but you didn't have any alcohol or you didn't have enough alcohol. Maybe you had like two sips of your glass of wine. That is for sure a sign that the food and, and likely gluten is causing that problem. That was one sign that I had that when I would go out, this is much farther into my gluten uh, sensitivity. So closer to when I found out that gluten was a problem that I would feel drunk. So that's the that, absolutely gluten-free is definitely one thing I would also recommend. Um, if you're constipated, making sure that you're drinking somewhere between 60 to 80 ounces of water per day. Um, and that, you know, also too, that you're being active, that can also help like walk, even just walking, brisk walking is awesome. And that you're getting enough fiber in, you have to cover your bases of like the basic lifestyle things before you start looking for other things. Um, you know, you could even try like magnesium citrate is a really great thing that you can do, um, once or twice a day. And, um, that can also help get the stools moving along. So that's, that's definitely something else to do. But I would, if you're, if you're, if you have diarrhea, I would absolutely recommend a food journal and do it for seven days and then write down like what time you ate and what, what happened? Like, did you start getting a headache during eating or did you start feeling sick or whatever? And then you can, you start reviewing it and you may start to see patterns. Like I said, it was eggs for me. I would have picked up eggs had I known, had I, had I done that. Mm -hmm. So. It's really interesting is after I gave birth to my son, uh, he's two, just over two and a half now, um, 
I developed a bunch of weird allergies, like out of nowhere. I don't know if it was just because the body went through something so crazy. Um, but all of a sudden I was allergic to lamb and eggs to the point where if I, 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 I baked this gluten-free cake uh, for a friend's birthday and I think I had to use two eggs and it was a giant cake and I had a sliver of it and I thought, okay, it's just like, this is like an eighth of an egg. And I still had really a bad negative, you know, uh, running to the bathroom experience. Um, I thought to myself, this is crazy, but I had to avoid eggs for a whole year and I love eggs, um, and avoid lamb and all the other foods that were on that, you know, the allergy test. And I avoided them for a year and then I, I retested myself. I had a little bit and I was fine. And it's like, so I just had to sort of stay away from those foods long enough and then I could eat them again. Um, and then I got retested recently cause I, we were, we were like looking into why we were feeling certain ways. Uh, couldn't really figure it out. I, I totally agree with you with food journaling. Um, I would have never, ever, ever seen this as a problem. I am highly allergic to bananas now out of nowhere. Wow. If I eat, um, a little, like, uh, we, we got plantain chips from Trader Joe's for my son. I totally forgot, you know, cause this is yeah, kind of weird. Banana family. I ate, um, a, a plantain chip and had to run to the bathroom and I thought, what is going on? I love bananas. Like what the heck? Um, do you have, do you have any issues with avocado? No, I love avocado. They're in the, they're in the same family. That's so, so funny. Knock but on wood. That it yeah, doesn't. right. Yeah. <laughs> knock on wood. But it's it's interesting. The body ebbs and flows. And, you know, I was probably eating tons of eggs. Like I was eating tons of eggs for a long time. Sometimes we eat too much of something. The body goes, hey, hold this, hold on a sec. We need yep. more variety. And I wouldn't say I was overdoing bananas, but, you know, who knows what overdoing is. And then, of course, there's the belief system like Dr. Diadamo, eat right for your blood type, that we should only be eating the foods that genetically we were predisposed to. So my genes for thousands of years were nowhere near bananas, right? We were, I was more like the northern tribes. And so um, I should be sticking to the foods that grow more in the north, if if that is accurate. What's your What's your take on dialing in food you know do you think people should look to more, more like the eat right for your blood type do you think that they um should get tested regularly if they're having these problems or or just constantly food journal like what what's uh what's the best way to dial in the healthy diet for someone right now knowing that it ebbs and flows well i think the big piece of it is not blowing off your symptoms i, I think most people who are sick and who are at a point where they're legitimately sick, especially if you have an autoimmune disease, if you've been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, I beg you, please start paying attention to your diet. It does matter. Um, I think with pretty much any autoimmune disease, going gluten-free is really the first place to start. And believe it or not, with most autoimmune disease, the trigger is in the gut. And in order to reduce the trigger, and begin to slow down the autoimmune process and stop the because it, it's literally like your immune system is being triggered over and over and over again by it could be a gut infection. It could just be the bacteria in your gut, but your gut is leaky. And so gluten has this m sort of magical power, so to speak, where it has the capacity to create gut leakiness in everyone. And I'm not I'm not just making a statement, a broad statement like this with no science to back me up, but there actually was research done in the last year or so that showed that, and actually, wait, let me think, it's 2005. It was a study that was done by um, a team that included Dr. Alessio Fasano. And what they did was they took four groups of people. They took people that are, quote, normal and healthy. They took a group of people that had non- uh, celiac gluten sensitivity, a group of people that had celiac that was still active, and then a group of people that had celiac, but it was, I guess they would say in remission, but like you're, it's just controlled. It's they've, they've gotten healthy. They're sort of normalized, but the celiac is still there and they have to remain gluten-free. And they exposed these four groups of people to gluten, the same amounts of gluten. And what they found is in every single person, even the healthy individuals that the gut 
got more permeable or leaky um, in everyone with that exposure to gluten. So why a healthy person is able to recover from that, you know, again, this is like, it's sort of like, what cards you end up with, you know, in that hand of where you are in your life. But um, everyone is exposed to this one trigger. And that's why I say with, with autoimmunity, it's really important to remove the triggers and gluten happens to be one of them. Um, and so I do think that it's worthwhile if you have a lot of digestive problems or you have a litany of symptoms that don't make any sense and you just don't feel well, do a, I mean, you could do a food journal. That's the simple and the cheapest thing to do. I don't particularly love elimination diets. There can be problems because people can go too far eliminating too many things and then they can't complete it. So I would say like start with gluten, see how that goes. Um, if you believe something else is going on, take it out for two to three weeks and then you could try adding it back into your diet and testing it and see how it goes. See if you react in any way, shape or form. And that can include mood swings, emotional outbursts, anxiety, depression. It doesn't just have to be like diarrhea or constipation. And, um, you know, as far as the eat right for your blood type, um, I don't know. I, I have some reservations about the research behind that. Um, and I don't, I'm not a hundred percent, but I think there have been some, some legal issues that, that, uh, the author had come about in the last year or so. So, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for looking to research, making sure that we have sound research behind things. I do think there's a lot to be said of going back to more natural ways of eating um, and trying to incorporate wholer foods, more natural foods, um, getting away from processed foods. But I do think that everyone's diet should be unique in you know, I eat the Jen diet. My husband eats the Nick diet. I'm sure you eat the Ashley diet, it sounds like. So I think when people, like, they come in, they're like, I want to know what you eat. Tell me what you eat, and I'm going to eat like that. And I'm like, no, that's, that's, I understand that's easy, but that's not how this works. You know, I get, we didn't, we weren't born with some manual. We didn't slip out of the birth canal with this big book that we get to read our entire lives that will tell us everything about ourselves. It's not how it works. Life is a journey and we are here for different reasons. And maybe, just maybe, this illness or this sickness or this just unwellness that one feels, you know, I'm really happy and glad and grateful that I became sick because it gave me a totally different perspective on life. And for many people who have triumphed, like a lot of my clients that have been able to triumph over feeling sick, I understand how frustrating it is and you want to see progress now. But tuning back into yourself is, is really a gift. And it's something that is so easy to let fall to the wayside in our crazy, super busy, hectic, you know, the holidays, you know, when the holidays are here and no one pays attention to themselves. I mean, we're all like, oh, it's cookie time, you know, and like <laughs> we're eating things that we shouldn't be eating because, well, they're there, you know, and it's the holidays. But the reality of it is, when do we put ourselves first? When do we tune in and say, you know, I deserve better. And by me treating myself better, Maybe that'll rub off on my spouse. Maybe it'll rub off on my kids or my grandkids because they'll have a role model. I mean, my husband barely ate any vegetables when we first started dating. <laughs> Jeez, like 12 years ago. He now sometimes tells me I don't even put enough vegetables in our meals. He loves mushrooms. He used to hate mushrooms. He just started doing protein shakes. I have been doing protein shakes for almost 10 years. He just started doing protein shakes. It took 10 years, but it finally rubbed <laughs> off on him. So persistence is key, not being preachy, just taking care of you. And I think as you begin to take care and focus more on your own health, I think in many respects, we can become more compassionate for others. We can be more present for others in our lives and ultimately demonstrate unconditional love a lot better because I, I was told this one thing, and I know this isn't gluten related, but it was it was a nugget of wisdom that has stuck with me. Like that moment when my husband comes home and he sits on the couch and, and you know, there's like 
five things that need to get done. And I'm like, um, could you help with that? And I'm really annoyed because he just went and did what he felt he needed to do. But somebody had reminded me, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes men will tune in more to what they need than women. We always feel like we need to constantly be doing things for everyone else or around the house. And we don't spend time just saying, you know what? No, I'm going to stop for five minutes and I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to go to this doctor's appointment or I'm going to go to this meditation class or I'm going to make dietary changes. And guess what? I don't, I can't eat gluten. So if you guys want gluten, that's fine. You can eat it outside of the house, but in the house, I'm not cooking gluten because I don't eat it because I'm the cook and that's how it goes. And you put your foot down and set boundaries about what is, what you are willing and not willing to do. And a lot of us are uncomfortable with that because it causes conflict. But the reality of it is when we get to a place where we can tune into ourselves, it begins with diet. It begins with exercise. It begins with lifestyle choices. Um, it really does spread outward. And it then starts to have this beautiful unfolding effect through the idea of con unconditional love, being present, all this other good stuff that I think is what makes life really beautiful. I love it. You know what I realized is is we got we jumped right into the topic, but for those who have no idea what gluten is, we never uh, actually explained what it is. Um, I know a lot of people see <laughs> gluten free products, but there's like uh, coconut waters at at Whole Foods that are gluten free, and um, I always laugh when I see products that would never ever contain gluten, like coconut water, and yet they have the certification gluten free. So, what is gluten? Well, gluten is a spongy protein that is found in specific grains, most notably wheat, barley, and rye. It's also in other ancient forms of wheat, such as farro, which is really popular in Italy, um, spelt, einkorn. Those are probably the most um, notable ones you'll see. Sometimes at Whole Foods, you might find wheat berries. But um, that's predominantly where gluten hides so to speak and the what gluten does is it's a this spongy gooey gluey thing that will bind together ingredients and that's what gives bread its wonderful softness and depending on the gluten content of bread for example that will determine how how um soft and chewy the the bread will actually be um and so the protein can be difficult for some people to digest. Um, nobody has an enzyme in their body to be able to digest gluten. And so believe it or not, technically, if you can't tolerate gluten, you have a gluten sensitivity, not gluten intolerance, because an intolerance implies that you don't have the enzyme. So like lactose intolerance means that you don't have the enzyme lactase in order to break lactose down. So the gluten sensitivity implies that there is an immune reaction that is happening as a result of a specific food like gluten coming into the body. So they're just different actions. Um, but yeah, that's what gluten is. Very cool. Now there's a, in oats, there's a protein so similar to gluten that a lot of people end up needing to avoid oats as well. Do you talk about uh, going grain-free or uh, gluten-free plus oats uh, for some people? Well, some people can tolerate oats, other people can't. I seem to be able to tolerate them just fine. Um, a lot of, with celiac disease, it's really hit or miss. Either way, if you are gluten sensitive, you do need to avoid oats that are not certified gluten-free. So you can't just go to the store and pick up a regular container, even if it's organic, off the shelf, because those are contaminated with gluten due to the way that oats are um, where, where they are grown, number one, they're usually grown next to fields of wheat and then also the way that they are processed. So regular oats are contaminated. You must look for packaging that says certified gluten-free oats. And so they test them to make sure. And just so everyone knows when a product is certified gluten-free, it means that there is extra rigor that has gone into the process of ensuring that products are safe. Um, gluten-free isn't necessarily bad, but the label gluten-free, at least in Canada and um, 
uh, the United States implies that the gluten content in that particular food, the total content is below a specific threshold. So legally, it would be below 20 parts per million. However, products that are certified gluten-free are typically lower than that. Most It depends on the certifying body that um, does the, the certification. Some would be less than 10 parts per million. Some are less than five parts per million. Some are less than three parts per million. There's no such thing as zero gluten. They can't test for zero gluten. They just have to test beneath the threshold. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting thing, things about oats. Some people can tolerate them. Some people can't. Um, I you know, I'm, you can do grain free. That's always an option for some people. Um, I tend to be in the camp that you shouldn't take out more foods than you need to. And one reason why is that I believe, and I feel just from my clinical experience and talking to other dietitians and nutritionists is that we have kind of gone maybe a little too far in the case of just demonizing foods, demonizing food groups, demonizing, like, that's why I said, I, I've kind of gotten away from this, like that gluten is, is bad for everyone. I don't necessarily believe that anymore. Gluten just doesn't work for me. And maybe it doesn't work for you. And maybe it doesn't work for somebody else that's listening to this podcast. And that's fine. That's all it is, is that that affects us and us alone. We shouldn't go and apply that to everyone else out there because we don't know a particular person's situation. And so when people go on these very restrictive diets, oftentimes they're eliminating foods that, yeah, sure, may trigger a problem. But at the end of the day, if you just eliminate the food triggers, it doesn't mean that you're actually solving what's causing the leaky gut or the gut inflammation in the first place. That's one trigger. You have to get all of the triggers out and then you have to do work to resolve the leakiness and the inflammation throughout the gut. You have to do work to do that. Um, so food restrictions alone are not the sole, um, ban it's a band aid essentially. Um, and so like for a lot of my clients, they spend a lot of time, too much time restricting too much food and they end up in a state where they're maybe re now restricting macronutrients too much. Like they're not eating enough protein or they're not eating any fat um, or they're eating such a small diet that they're now like in tears because they don't know what to eat because everything makes them sick. And so this is where I'm like, okay, if you're starting to have problems, reach out for help. Let's find the triggers. Let's have a common sense plan to get this situation rectified and get you back up and running in three to six months, depending on how sick you were before. It always varies. Um, but it is important to know that just taking food out and just res res further restricting your diet is oftentimes not going to resolve the underlying imbalance. It just removes the symptoms so long as you don't eat those foods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And great, great advice to be proactive and, you know, continue to listen to your body and continue to, um, to work with your body and, and not demonize foods like, you know, from the 1950s to, um, you know, 2010, probably right about there, we demonized fat, right? And now we're demonizing carbs. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's like a teeter totter. If you go too extreme on any one end, uh, we're going to cause nutrient deficiencies and imbalances. We need to come back to a more whole foods, holistic approach and eat, eat foods that are real foods and less processed foods. In fact, um, I posted that you were going to be on the show a few days ago in our Facebook group, um, Learn True Health Facebook group. You can go to Learn True Health and search for the Facebook group. Um, I mean, you can go on Facebook and search Learn True Health in Facebook to find the group, or you can go to learntruehealth.com slash group, join the group, and, and you can pose questions to uh, future guests. Barnetti uh, says, so many people are going gluten-free, which is fantastic, but they're just substituting a really bad processed food for a gluten-free processed food. At the end of the day, isn't that still bad for you? Even gluten-free products are starting to become unhealthy, chock full of corn most of the time, GMO corn, for example. Um, how do you, uh, what's the advice that you give people who uh, begin, like they go gluten-free and, uh, and they just see that they could just keep eating all the junk foods, um, all the processed, highly, highly processed sugary junk foods that in some cases are actually higher on the glycemic index, 
uh, that are gluten free? Yeah, absolutely. That is a great question. And it's something that I personally have, have faced. Um, when I went gluten free, I did that. I just swapped everything out and anytime, maybe you'll appreciate this. I don't know, but anytime, um, I would go to a new grocery store and I would see some like gluten-free cookies or gluten-free brownies. <laughs> I was like, well, I got to take one for the team and try this because, <laughs> you know, I wasn't readily available at the time. And I ended up eating like Believe it or not, at one point I was eating gluten-free cookies for breakfast because it was the fastest thing that I could grab in the morning and take to work with me at the time. And I ended up as a result, you're not going to be shocked by this, Ashley. I ended up with adrenal fatigue and candida um, because of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was a big eye opener. Um, it's actually part of the impetus for how my book ended up coming out, the savvy gluten-free shopper, because at the time that my husband got laid off. And so we had to find creative ways to make our, the, cause we lost two thirds of our income. We had to find creative ways to be able to pay for functional practitioners and supplements and testing out of pocket. And, and on then also too paying for a much healthier, cleaner, gluten-free, um, diet. And so that was how my book came about. It was just all the things that I figured out because I'm always like, how can I make this work? You know, I can figure it out. There's always a way, there's always a solution, even though I don't have the answer yet, I'll find it. And so, um, but that's the thing. A lot of these processed foods, they look really appetizing and very tasty, but yes, there is a lot of junk in them. So I actually had a question uh, from a reader of my um, newsletter today, and she had asked me about gluten-free bread. And so I have this like gluten-free bread cheat sheet with recipes and, that you can make and also just store-bought options. And she's like, I was reading this other site, and they said that they gave a list of all these ingredients that are often in gluten-free bread that are really toxic and bad for you. And I go and look at this bread that I bought that you suggested on your list, and they're all on there. <laughs> and I'm really confused. And this is my response. If you eat 80 to 85% real food, like things that grow in the ground, you know, if you eat meat or fish or eggs or dairy, fine, but like real stuff, you don't necessarily have to worry so much about that other 10 to 15%. Don't, don't freak out. You know, it's sort of like how the moms all end up eating their kids candy. You know, they're, they're really good on their diet, but then all of a sudden the Halloween and the United States comes around and they're eating, you know, their kids candy and they're like, oh my gosh, forgive me for this one night. You're not going to die from having a piece of gluten-free bread. The idea is to make the best, the best choice possible, but fill the majority of your diet with the best, most nutritious food that you can. And if you decide to have a gluten-free sandwich once a month or something, you go out to lunch, whatever, don't stress about it because stress is stress. It doesn't matter whether it's 9-11, like I lived through, or you're stressing out because there's canola oil in your gluten-free bread sandwich or something like that. This is the problem that we're in. We're constantly creating, we act like our food now has become World War II. You know, I do think it's really sad that we have so many ingredients that are grown or produced from GMO crops. And mm -hmm. I do my darndest to make the best decision possible. I also look for companies that are non-GMO verified. Um, and even that companies don't include things like corn. But ultimately, I think sometimes we just we get so upset over one thing. Like you have to be careful. Cause again, this comes back to elimination and restrictive dieting is that you can end up spilling over into a, a, what is actually an eating disorder called orthorexia. And so what I have focused on tremendously in the last, I would say almost year is getting people to stop being afraid of food. Stop demonizing food. Focus on what you can have, what you want your diet to look like, the values that you want your diet to embody. Focus on that. Be positive. Stop creating stressors where there don't need to be any. And, and you know what? If you have that piece of gluten-free bed, forgive yourself and move on. It's not the end of the world. And beating yourself up mentally and emotionally for these kind of things is really not healthy. Um, and I don't, I also get nervous when I see people like, oh, I can't eat anything here. 
there could be it, it's probably fried in with soy oil and i'm like well we're going out to eat this is where we all chose to eat like if you can't have soy and you have an allergy that's totally fine if you have a thyroid issue and whatever that's totally fine i get i get that but where we get to the the level where you make excuses for why you can't eat anything um, that's, that's, that's really troubling. That is, that is unfortunately disordered eating land. Um, so again, it's about being practical. It's about being healthy. Um, but it's also about in some respects, give yourself a 10 to 15% break. Don't stress out about it. If you're in a big healing thing and you're doing a protocol, then yeah, stick to your protocol, stick to what your doctor or your dietitian or your nutritionist has told you. But generally speaking, if you're not in that place, you know, as long as it's gluten free, um, you know, I'm not going to get mad at you because you decided <laughs> to have some sugar or something like that. I, I don't think that that's like people are afraid to tell me what they ate because they're so ashamed. And I'm like, that's the problem right there is that you're ashamed of what you ate. Mm. Let's stop judging ourselves. Let's walk. Let's backtrack that of acting like everything's bad and we're bad girls or I was bad today because I ate this. Like, let's stop that negative talk. That's, that's my two cents on it. Yeah, there's definitely something there, especially when we get an emotional kick out of being bad. You know, like we restrict ourselves, restrict ourselves, restrict ourselves. And then and then there's this relief that comes from uh, being being a little bad, you know, eating some ice cream or, or whatever. Uh, I remember learning from Joshua Rosenthal. I, I recently graduated from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and Joshua Rosenthal is the creator. And he said that he would be, you know, uh, on the way home after working with clients as a health counselor, um, he would uh, buy a pint of ice cream and sit in his car eating it. Like, you know, uh, going, what's going on? What am I doing? Like, because he was so good all the time. And then he had to just all of a sudden snap and eat a pint of ice cream. And, yeah. and that's why, you know, he says... Um, we need to, well, first of all, we need to focus on what's missing. Cause if we're feeling like we're missing joy, happiness, love, connection, intimacy, um, it, we're going to look to other ways of getting it. And oftentimes, cause there's such an emotional component with food, we're going to look to it there of pleasure because we eat some sugar. It triggers the same centers as the brain as if we were having sex, as if we were having an intimate, loving evening with our partner. And so if we're missing that, we will look to the food as drugs to, to stimulate that. And there is an addictive component to wheat. I had um, yes. Dr. Davis um, on the, uh, the show. He's the author of uh, Wheat Belly. And he talked all about the the uh, the actual like physiological addiction. Like we are addicted to cigarettes. Our body can become addicted to sugar, like too much sugar, excess sugar. And the body can easily become addicted to gluten. When you teach people to go gluten free, how do you help them go through the withdrawal that they may experience? Well, not everybody experiences withdrawal, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, some people do. And so my take and I have actually had clients that get really sick within three to five days after taking all gluten out they feel like they're in a, a wrecked state and what I do is slow down the process I'm like let's step you down and it's sad to think that that you can't just take somebody off wheat or off gluten and they should be fine but everyone's system reacts very differently. And if we're going to step somebody down, I'd rather them be functional and feel okay and get to work and be able to care for their kids and their family than them be really sick. Um, because there's something going on that they need to slowly detox off of it. And again, it's about, you know, we're all like kind of cars in a sense. And the same goes with protocols and different things that we choose to do. It's like, you have to kind of, balance or weigh that plane of like, do you push more gas or do you put your foot on the brake and slow it down? And there's nothing wrong with either way of doing it. Again, I know I've interviewed Dr. Davis and he's a colleague of mine, but not everybody can just take things out cold turkey. I wish it was that simple, but it's not for some. And I have a client now where I was like, okay, well, let's take um, the five most common things you eat that have gluten in them. And we're going to swap them out for gluten-free items. 
but we're not going to touch anything else because she has, she's one of these issues. She's one of these people that's very sensitive. Like she, her system goes into overdrive and she gets incredibly ill and she can't afford that. She has a really high power job. She can't afford that. And so we have to go at a pace that works mm-hmm. for her in her own diet, in her own life. And she'll get there, but she just got, her journey is going to be a little bit longer than mine was. And that's okay. So in some cases, uh, like heroin, <laughs> they're they're going <laughs> to slowly get off the gluten to where yeah. they're gluten-free. Um, I can understand that. My, my husband and I, um, we just went cold turkey with gluten. But when it came to going dairy-free, that was a slow and painful process because we love dairy. But our bodies don't. But my husband and I, uh, from childhood, we've had symptoms of um, the inability to handle dairy. And, um, and for many years I was dairy free, but got back into it. And once you're back into love and cheese, man, there's, you know, it's, it's hard to get off cheese. Uh, and we did, we finally eventually hundred percent converted to being dairy free. And now that we've been dairy free long enough, we, we don't ever see ourselves going back, but, um, I can understand that in some cases, it, it is easier to slowly replace, like you said, I love that you said that there was the five main things that you eat with, with gluten in it. So what are the five main things that have barley, uh, wheat or rye? And let's, let's find substitutes. When I first went gluten free, I, I said to my husband, I'm like a food detective because he hated sitting <laughs> in the grocery store for an hour, standing in the grocery store for an hour where I read every single ingredient. And, and yet I had to become this food detective. Um, I, but we, we found some really fun alternatives. Like you can make spaghetti squash, um, you know, instead of you can make spaghetti squash be like spaghetti, right. Or you can make spiral, uh, vegetables like, uh, like zucchini and potato. Oh yeah. Like lots. There's so many things you can use sweet potatoes. We, we got it. We actually got a, um, an industrial strength well, off Amazon, this industrial strength cutter to make sweet potato fries. Cause we were sp- spending so much money on sweet potato fries, like the frozen kind at, at Costco. And I said, you know, I'd love to see if we could do this organic and without all the additives. And so, um, we were just baking our own sweet potato fries and we felt like we were Kings, you know, eating like Kings and, and it was, yeah. you know, eating healthier on a budget. Anytime I can figure out how to make something from scratch, um, I'd rather do that. And, uh, but man, I don't, you know, I really don't miss it. I, at, at first I kind of missed the bagels and the, the donuts and all that. But when I just, I realized that no matter what the substitute isn't going to be as good as the real thing. And if it is, we end up spending a fortune because we end up eating way too much of it because we're like indulging. Yeah. And so I just kind of just gave, gave up on that idea and, and focused more on, well, well, how can I make vegetables more fun? You know, how can I exactly. play around with all the other grains, you know, like uh, quinoa and, and rice, if I if I wanted to include that? What are some, you know, can you share some, re- what are your favorite recipes or uh, kind of like the gateway recipes to get people excited about gl- going gluten-free? Well, one of the things that I do as far as the gateways, because truth be told, everybody's tastes are different. Mm-hmm. And some people love dishes that I like would gag at. And that's fine. I'm again, not judging them, but that's what they like. That's what they grew up with. And so usually what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I want to know what your favorite meals are in your family. And then let's figure out gluten-free alternatives to them. And when I say gluten-free, usually, um, we're looking more toward like paleo with either grains or beans. So it's not, it's a healthy gluten-free, you know, it's the healthy gluten-free diet, the way it should be not, um, not with all the junky, like I don't give anybody recipes that probably have more than like seven ingredients. Cause I cannot bear to cook like gluten-free cookbooks drive me insane because they <laughs> cook with too many ingredients in one recipe. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to buy five bags of flour and then mix them in these little minute things, you know, little minute proportions. Like that's, that's insane to me. I don't like to bake to begin with. And so I just never, I always like things to be simple and efficient. How can we get to the goal without too much detail, too much frivolousness? Let's just get there as straightforward as we can. And so like for me, one of the things that I figured out, like I love spaghetti squash now, love, love, love it. Um, a lot of sauces like, uh, pesto, uh, bolognese sauce, a lot of like really 
awesome ragus and marinaras are all gluten free. So I've been able to hold on to a lot of my own Italian culture. Mm -hmm. Um, for sure. A lot of Mexican food or Mexican cuisine and Latin American cuisine is also naturally gluten-free as well. And so like, I'll just pull stuff up on YouTube and be like, how do I make this? <laughs> or I'll take cooking classes locally. Um, you know, like I found a, an Italian restaurant, the chef is from the um, Fl Florence area of Italy. And I was like, look, if I pay you, could I come to your restaurant for a couple hours on a Saturday and you show me how to make like gluten-free gnocchi and, um, you know, just like all these different sauces, like amatriciana, which is like really wonderful with pancetta and onions. And, um, it's just so good. And, you know, that's the thing. Like I've explored so many like Thai food, Indian food, all these different cuisines and looked for ways that I could make them gluten-free. Um, you know, so I still take, and you can do online cooking classes too. I took a cooking class from Gordon Ramsay actually earlier this year. It was like this whole series and okay. Yeah, I couldn't, I can't make all the food. I'm not going to eat all the food, but I did learn a lot of really great cooking wisdom and pearls from him mm -hmm. just about cooking in general and, and ways of approaching like how to make scrambled eggs. Like, yeah, I can't eat scrambled eggs, but my husband can. And I didn't know how to really, I guess apparently I make scrambled eggs wrong, but you know, <laughs> I learned a lot about technique. So I I've gotten, I've gotten away from that. Like my nose is in the air, like, Oh, it's not exactly how I want it to be. You know, if I go to a cooking class and obviously there's flour around, I'm like, I'm not going to eat anything, but I'm going to watch, I'm going to learn. Um, that's always been my mission is to watch, to learn, to ask questions. Like, what can I do? What can I take away from this situation? And having that attitude keeps me really positive. Um, so one of my favorite recipes is, and, and I'm so sorry if anyone doesn't eat meat, but um, is this balsamic beef, shredded beef recipe that I make in a crock pot. I love crock pot recipes because I can make a lot. I love re leftovers. Um, and so you literally take the meat, you put it in the crock pot, you shred a bunch of onions, you just throw it underneath the meat. Sorry, I'm doing this out of order, but <laughs> onions first, <laughs> then the meat. You add on um, some salt and pepper. You do, I think I'm doing, uh, let's see, like a quarter cup of balsamic vinegar. I use like a cheaper version. I don't use my 25 year aged <laughs> fancy stuff from Italy. Um, some broth and a can of uh uh, tomato paste, make sure it's gluten free, um, and some uh, bay leaves. And I let that simmer for like 10 to 12 hours on low. And oh my gosh, everything tastes amazing. And I freeze some, like I'm really smart. I'm very savvy in my book. I, I discovered that 40% of all the food that comes into the house, um, it's 25 to 40% is thrown away because it goes bad. So you're, you're literally throwing money in the trash. So to me, it's like, I learned what I could freeze. And, and as someone who, you know, I might be short on time, I might not always have time to cook, but if I cook large dishes, I can freeze two or three servings in the freezer and then pull them out in a pinch. And maybe I'll add some frozen vegetables to them. You can certainly freeze extra rice or extra quinoa. Um, and you can also freeze beans. Like I use my Instapot to make black beans beans and then I'll freeze them in single serving little Tupperware containers, or you could use Ziploc bags or whatever the heck you want to use and freeze them and then pull them out. Like, again, that saves you a ton of money and it also saves you time. So, um, to me, I've always, like I freeze my sauces. I freeze pesto. I, I grow my own basil. I have my own garden. Like I've done whatever I can to try to tap into eating healthy. Like I said, that 80 to 85%, you eat whole, you eat real food as best you can. Um, and the rest, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I certainly, like I said, I eat gluten-free bread. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I don't. I'm not going to tell you that if you put a gluten-free donut in front of me, I'm not going to eat it. I'll probably <laughs> try and enjoy it. I don't have them very often. I think the, I've had like two gluten-free donuts in the last three years and only because, frankly, they're hard to come by. <laughs> so, you know, I don't mind if it's so, like we were in Italy. And by the way, it is so much easier to eat gluten-free in Italy. Like if you want to go on the most amazing and we didn't like I planned it myself. It was the most amazing food ever. Florence is to die for. They have gluten-free, totally gluten-free bakeries there. They have gluten-free gelato. What? 
Oh my gosh. Like we went to, they have restaurants that are specific and certified by the celiac organization there that you can go to. Like I had homemade pasta, gluten-free pasta with boar ragu. And like, we just, we ate the, I had gluten-free pizza. Like we had the most amazing food. I never got sick ever. Every place was like, oh yeah, no problem. We can accommodate. Like it was insane how easy it was and embarrassing to be an American to realize like <laughs> how frustrating it has been here and to go to Italy of all places, the land, the home of, of bread and pasta. And they're like, no problem. We know all about it. How do you say gluten free in Italian? Uh, senza glutine. <laughs> <laughs> so you would say, like I would say, uh, sono ciliaca. So I am celiac. That's what that's what you would say to the server. Um, and you know, you you just look for and tons of gluten free products, and it's marked everywhere. It will say senza glutine. Um, and it was incredible. And actually, I'm happy to give you the link for it because I think it's a fantastic resource. But there is a so the Italians are much further advanced than us, as or at least the, the U.S. and Canada is as far as gluten free is concerned. And so they have this amazing um, app that you can put on your phone and look up restaurants like we have app rest, these like apps here in the U.S., mm -hmm. but they're not, they're not vetted. Like any restaurant can put themselves on there. And a lot of times the people that leave reviews don't know what they're talking about. So you can end up getting sick from somebody saying, Oh yeah, the fries are gluten free, except they're fried in a fryer with other things that have gluten in them. Yep. And they didn't know to ask. So with this app, these restaurants are picked. I guess they have to apply. I don't know what the process is, but this is through the celiac association. So they have to get a, uh, some sort of designation that they can um, actually uh, feed people that have celiac disease. And so the app is fantastic because you can put in where you are, can use your GPS and find restaurants locally, like pizzerias, nice, uh, nice upscale restaurants. Um, you know, like I found the, the, the gelaterias and all this stuff. The only thing I would tell you is just make sure to Google the address. Cause we did find on most occasions that the address was not quite accurate, but the rest <laughs> of it was fine. <laughs> but that was the fantastic thing. And so a lot of the hotels we stayed at as well, they had, um, a breakfast in the morning and they had gluten-free items there. It's amazing. It's amazing to think that. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, you're you're going to have to like create a, a tour group of, of uh, gluten-free people <laughs> to all go together on tour to Italy. That sounds um, so delicious and so much fun. That is uh, very, very cool. Um, you're talking about the Instapot, which is a, which is a pressure cooker. Uh, I got to share my, my recipe. I learned this from a, a fellow gluten-free friend. You get your beans, so you get your black beans and you chop up some onion and, uh, you could even throw in a bay leaf if you want. And then you get ribs. So, uh, whatever kind of ribs you like that you can stuff in there and you put the enough water for the beans at the bottom. And, uh, and then you, so you put the beans in first with the, with the onions and, um, uh, you don't have to put uh, all the water for, for the beans, just a little bit less because um, the ribs are going to give off some water. And you then you stuff the rest of it with the ribs, just many as much ribs as you can. You stuff it in and close it up, cook it for 90 minutes. And what happens is that the flavor of the ribs, and of course you put some salt, right? The flavor of the ribs permeates the beans, and it's so delicious. And then, of course, you want to make some fresh vegetables or whatever to go with it. Um, but that, and, and then if you've made enough, uh, you've got some leftovers. That, and I fully agree with you. We should always uh, make leftovers. If we're going to spend a half an hour in the kitchen, uh, might as well uh, cook twice. Uh, sorry, cook once, eat twice. Yeah. So we cook, cook once. We could cook once and eat three times. Uh, we could solve this whole problem of I am so busy. What do I do for lunch? You know, your lunch is always your leftovers from dinner and then it's delicious. And it's even more delicious the next day, as you know, from Italian cooking, because all the flavors uh, take their time to kind of blend together. Um, and so that saves us time, saves us money and uh, and also saves our health. Absolutely. And that's why I do that on a regular basis. And, um, today I, you know, I had this, um, 
this really cool, uh, I'm t- trying out these new uh, quinoa cups. And I was like, well, I really need some protein with it. And I just pulled out some of my um, that shredded beef from the freezer and I brought that with me. So I had my protein, I had my carbs, I had, you know, really great source of fat and I felt, you know, awesome. So yeah, I agree with you. Very cool. It has been such a pleasure having you on the show. Let's talk about, let's make sure everyone knows all about uh, what you do so they can keep learning from you. Of course, the links to everything that Jennifer does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast. So you've got this great uh, podcast that that listeners should follow, which is Gluten Free School Podcast. And that can be found on your website, glutenfreeschool.com. Um, what else should the listeners know about? Ooh. Um, I have a really fantastic newsletter. I email once to twice a week, just cool things like whether it's a new recipe or something cool I've found or a story, um, or a lesson about something that I find with clients. So I'm always sharing information and I, uh, yeah, I have the podcast. I have a great Facebook page as well. You can just, um, search for gluten-free school, all three words separated by a space and you will, it will definitely pop up. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I also have a great, uh, webinar if anybody's really struggling or wants to know how to go gluten-free in a way that's not going to make you crazy or depressed or feel very isolated. I have a really great free webinar, um, that, you know, people can join in on and select the time that, um, I host on a regular basis. And, um, you know, that can be a really great opportunity to, again, get in this like positive frame of mind about what can I do ideas about how you can do it and practical ways to be able to eat out, have family gatherings, feed your family so that you're being nourished first (laughs) and, um, how to do it sensibly and read labels and all that kind of stuff. And you've also got a really fun blog. I'm looking at your recipes on your blog and it's making me hungry. Apple (laughs) cashew salad, moist, gluten-free turkey meatloaf. Um, Really, yeah, really delicious stuff. So very fun. And then you also work with, um, you work with clients. What does it look like to work with you? Yeah, so I work privately with um, clients. I don't see a lot of clients um, simply because I like to give my clients a lot of attention. So I... It is, you know, if it's something that somebody is interested in looking for more help, please feel free to get in touch and I can let you know what my availability is. But we dive deep. We look at labs. We look at conventional labs, um, functional labs. We look at, you know, like I spend hours with clients just going over health histories and diving deep into little tiny details that they've blown off but are actually really important clues. And then I put together protocols based on all the information that are unique to them so that they can really start seeing results. And I work with a client where they are. So, you know, not everybody starts off with a protocol, maybe like that one client I talked about, maybe it's just a stepping you down from gluten because it's something you need to do, but you're not just, you're not quite there yet. You know, everybody's journey is different. And, um, I always describe my relationship with clients. Like I'm your co-pilot, you know, we're on this journey together, but I'm your co-pilot. I help make it happen. I help guide the plane, but you're going to make the ultimate decision of what you're comfortable with, what your values are about your health. Not everybody wants to use pharmaceutical drugs. A lot of people want to look for more natural options whether it be supplements or food, lifestyle changes, et cetera. And I have to find creative solutions that will work for them as well as supporting them and coaching them through that process. Um, but then I also have group programs as well for people that, you know, want to do like sugar cleanses and all sorts of things to really change their relationship with food, but they need a little bit more of a group environment or they're looking for something that's a little more cost effective for them. So there's definitely a lot of options. Um, I also offer self-study courses like how to dine out and such, um, gluten-free because that's a big problem for people. And it's always to me just sharing everything I know with you in a way that is effective and helps you then use the information in your real life and make things happen. Fantastic. (laughs) And you also have this book, the savvy gluten-free shopper. Can you give us, uh, give us a tip from your book? What is one thing that, um, we can do to, uh, be gluten-free and save money when we're, uh, grocery shopping? Yeah. Um, well, 
green beans, for example, green beans frozen are a lot less expensive than, than fresh green beans. That's one thing. Um, any fruit that you buy can be frozen. So before it starts to go bad, like bananas, peel them, they're getting a little spotty and you're like, mm, I'm not sure I might not eat them before they go bad, peel them, throw them into Ziploc bags and freeze them. And then you can either bake with them. You can make banana, uh, soft serve with them. You can use them in shakes. Uh, not you, Ashley, because I know <laughs> that they'll make you sick. But um, that's one thing that you can also do. Any like fro- like fruit, like if you buy strawberries and they're going to go bad or they're start getting a little bit moldy, cut off the moldy spots, rinse them off and throw them into a freezer bag and use them. Don't let them go to waste. Um, like I said, freeze beans. Even if you aren't, if you don't have an Instapot, that's totally fine. But if you have like a can of beans and you don't get to all of them, freeze the rest of them within three to four days. Um, You can freeze the extra rice that you make. You can freeze the extra quinoa. Um, You can even chop up onions and freeze them. And that way when you go to cook, so you don't have to go cutting onions and crying every single time you do that, freeze them and then just throw them into the pan. They defrost very quickly. So smart. Um, a friend of mine, uh, I learned from her, she would take all the garlic she could get her hands on, chop it up at like in a food processor, add like olive oil. And then yep. she would take, um, uh, ice cube trays mm-hmm. and, and put this mixture into the ice cube trays, freeze it, and then put it in a bag. And anytime she was doing a stir fry and she, you know, you can also do it this with, um, ginger and, um, green onion chopped up it, it, yep. if you get ginger and green onion chop it up finely put it in some oil and let it sit there then use that mixture in your stir fry it, it will taste like the most delicious asian food something happens when you mix ginger with green onion it's delicious but yeah she would take that and anytime she was doing a stir fry she'd grab one of these frozen cubes of of garlic and just throw it right in and it would just k- take it up to a whole new level and save her lots of time because she'd do everything in bulk you know, yep. I, I, I think that's so smart. And also, I love that you hired that uh, chef to teach you because uh, chefs learn how to do everything in bulk and everything fast and for multiple people, but also fresh. Um, exactly. So fresh ingredients. So there's lots of tips and tricks that we can learn. You know, something that uh, my son loves is uh, pancakes. But of course, I'm not going to feed him um, these gluten free flours. Like you said, it takes like five different you know flours to mix together. So I do uh, flourless pancakes, one banana, and just depending on the size of the banana, the size of the eggs, if they're smaller eggs, I'll do three eggs. If it's a really large banana, I might do three eggs. But if it's a medium-sized banana and large eggs, I do one one banana and two large eggs. And um, and then I blend that in the blender, to, and then I... I uh, put some ghee in the pan and, uh, and I make pancakes. They, they come out a little bit more like crepes. So you have to be careful. You have to have medium to low heat. You have to really watch over them because they cook much faster than regular pancakes. Um, and then if, if you find that when you're flipping them, they break apart. Uh, I m- mixed some gelatin. So some collagen, uh, gelatin, uh, into them as well. That's a great protein source, by the way. Um, it's more common now in the grocery stores or in the health food stores than it was a few years ago. Um, but put a little bit of that in and, um, and they're delicious. Uh, what's funny is my husband's allergic to eggs. I'm allergic to pancakes and my son loves these things and my husband, I can't touch them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, if, if you want to do without, without, uh, bananas, I do it sometimes without bananas. I just do eggs and the gelatin protein powder. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I might add a little bit of stevia if I want them to be sweet. But they're delicious. Um, so there's different ways that you can play around with. You could probably just do that if you want to uh, do them egg free. You can do like a gelatin protein powder and uh, like the collagen gelatin protein powder and and, an, and a banana and blend it together with a little bit of water um, or coconut milk or something. But yeah, I played around with this over and over again. And they no matter how messy they turn out, my son eats them and loves them. And uh, it's it's healthy. So there's a lot of fun ways to go gluten free. Uh, I just want the listeners to know that that it can be fun. It can be delicious. It could be so healthy. There's so many benefits and that they can um, get you to hold their hand and guide them. If if they need that extra support, uh, Jennifer's there for them uh, and they can learn that from the gluten free school. So it's so exciting that you have all these resources. I know I've learned a lot today. 
And uh, I would love to have you back on the show anytime you want to come and share more recipes and more ways, uh, more tips and tricks for continuing this healthy lifestyle. Um, Jennifer, is there anything you'd like to share with the listeners to wrap up today's interview? I think part of it is, you know, that message of you want to really care for yourself, self-love, focus on you. Even if it's hard, find five minutes, you know, five minutes to shut the phone off, to shut the TV off or the computer and spend some time with you. Tune in, start paying attention to what's going on with you so that you can be more present and more patient and more loving for those around you. Because ultimately at the end of the day, that's what life's all about is to be healthy so that we can be present to those in our lives and the things that happen in life that are ultimately really beautiful. And if you thought that shut the phone off sounded like a swear word, you definitely need to shut the phone off. (laughs) Shut the phone off. Shut the phone off. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Jennifer. If you go, it's been amazing having you on the show. And I, I, I look forward to hearing all the success you have. And as you continue to grow and expand and help more people uh, gain their health through the gluten-free movement. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I wish everybody the best of luck on their journeys and certainly send any questions my way. I'm happy to answer them. And thank you so much. I really appreciate everything that you are doing, Ashley, because it's an amazing service to the worldwide community that has the opportunity to tune in and learn from all of this work that you do. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to takeyoursupplements.com and you could support us that way. You'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com or join our membership learntruehealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself. Gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to learntruehealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? Go to learntruehealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course Uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's takeyoursupplements.com for wonderful supplements learntruehealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership which is only open for a limited time you can get our free healthy cookbook and you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you just go to learntruehealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave